Hello and welcome to this episode of Prophecy, the End Times, and the Book of Revelation. We are in Revelation chapter 9. Uh, we have finished the first eight chapters and begun to see what's going to happen in the End Times events. We're not trying to read anything into these events. We're just trying to take it verse by verse, word by word, thought by thought, to understand exactly what God is doing in the end times. Uh, in the book of Revelation, we are getting a bird's eye view of the end times from God's perspective. Uh, as we looked at the other uh, timelines in the book of Revelation, or I'm sorry, other timelines in the Bible, we've seen that in the book of Matthew, it is from the disciples' perspective, what Jesus is telling the disciples, which is you and I, what we can be looking looking forward to, what we can see on our end, and that is we're going to see and hear about uh, deception and wars, rumors of wars, famines. Um, we're going to see uh, see those end times events that Jesus himself lays out for us. Uh, we'll start to see those ethnic tension battles that begin to happen, and we will see it from, from our perspective. We are keeping watch on the Middle East, especially uh, during this time. Uh, then you have in the book of Daniel, you have the ultimate timeline from the beastly perspective, the beastly empire that's going to be raised up and what's going to be going on in that system. And then from Revelation, you have the top down view of what is happening from God's perspective. Now, John is reporting on this. John is recording it from uh, his perspective. Uh, remember, John lived, um, died somewhere around 90 AD is kind of the assumption of around his death. Um, so John wrote the book of Revelation about the end of his life. John was writing from that perspective. He was, he was transported in time, across time, uh, to heaven to see these events taking place. And John is trying to describe this from his perspective, which is, uh, these are things that are foreign to him, things that he has never seen. And so, especially as we read chapter 9 today, we're going to see John trying to describe something that makes absolutely no sense to him. But when we look at it from our perspective, it can make sense to us. And so that's what we're going to look at today in chapter 9. So that is our focus. We're going to get into chapter 9 today, and I would like to just remind you of the events as we've seen them un, uh, laid out in the Bible. Again, we are reading not our own perceptions into these timelines. We are reading in just exactly what the Bible says and the way that the, the book of Revelation lays it out. Now, um, the book of Revelation first lays out the seven churches, and what we have looked at is the perspective that this is seven ages of the church, and that seems to correspond. Um, if you look at the church history across time, you can see that the ages of the church really correspond to the um, to the really from uh, from the time of Pentecost all the way until today, you can see how the church ages have been laid out across that time. The last of the church ages being the church age of Laodicea, which is very similar to the age that we live in today. So you can see how that is a very real, uh, real prospect. Uh, John is told in the book of Revelation, Starting in chapter four, it says, after these things, and what are the these things that it was referring to? So after these things, that was the things that he had just described, which was the seven ages of the church or the seven churches. Now, again, it's again speculation to say that it's seven ages of the church, but it seems to fit. Um, regardless, if it was just seven literal churches and then there was nothing else, or this was seven church ages, then John is told after these things, then the events are going to kick into high gear, and we're going to see that starting. And that after these things is the beginning of the, the seven years of tribulation. So the seven-year tribulation, which also corresponds to the what's called the final week in the book of Daniel. The final week is a seven-year time of tribulation. Um, and that, go back and watch where we talked about Daniel to get more of a perspective on what that final week means. So that was starting in Revelation 4. Then we had some events that happened. We had um, we had these things called the seals. That was the first series of events that were going to happen. We have seals, and it looks like seals 1 through 5 that happened very near the beginning. By the way, those seals also correspond to a lot of what Jesus talks about himself in Matthew 24. You have an, a midpoint event, and that is what is called the abomination of desolation. Now, the abomination of desolation is where you see the beastly empire attacking Israel, standing in a rebuilt temple in Israel. So that's why we think that the temple has to be rebuilt, or there has to be something along the lines of 
uh, of a temple. Maybe it's not the fully rebuilt temple, but there has to be something that is a place for this abomination of desolation event to take place. Now, the abomination is going to be an attack. And the attack is going to be not only on Israel as a whole, but it's also going to be specifically centered around Jerusalem. And this is going to kick off what is called Jacob's Trouble. Now, Jacob's Trouble is the Old Testament reference to the final three and a half years. And this is a period of time that Jesus says he calls it the Great Tribulation. So Jacob's Trouble and the Great Tribulation is the final three and a half year period. This is going to be a horrific three and a half years, especially for those in Israel. Um, though That's going to be a troublesome time. Now, as we have read this, as we get to the end of those three and a half years, that's when we have seals number six and seven that are broken. When those seals are broken, and remember the seals are holding together a scroll. Now, if you remember what a scroll would kind of look like, you'd have two parts of it. Um, that scroll is unrolled. And it is to be read, but it can't be read until the seals are broken. And so you had seven uh, seals, seven wax seals that would have been strings around the scroll with a seal uh, attaching each one. So there would have been seven of these seals. I'm not going to draw all of them up there, but that that would have been the idea once the seven seals are broken. Now the scroll is unre uh, unleashed and God can read the pronouncement of judgment upon the world. Now, after the seals are broken, the seventh seal unleashes what is called the trumpets. The trumpets are God's warning. So you have the seals that keep it, keep the scroll together. Then you had the breaking of the seals, the seals unroll, and now the trumpets. The trumpets are the heralding of what is about to come. Now what is about to come after the trumpets is we're going to see the bowls of wrath. So the bowls of wrath that God is going to pour out on the world, this is the wrath. These, the trumpets and the seals are not the wrath of God. The seals is going to unleash the scroll. The trumpets is going to be the sounding that the wrath is about to come. And the wrath, when it is poured out, the church will no longer be here, according to, again, what trumpet number seven talks about. So again, we're not reading into this. We're just reading it verse by verse, line by line. And this is the way the book of Revelation lays out the events. There is nothing prior to this that says anything about the removal of the church until we get to trumpet number seven. If you read the removal of the church prior to that, you're reading into the text because it's not it doesn't say it in the text in the book of Revelation. I know people have tried to use other justifications but there's nothing that is written there that you can really justify that position. So what I have said all along to people is, you know, you can hope for a pre-tribulation rapture, but you'd better plan for a rapture that happens on the seventh trumpet. That's when the rapture, according to the book of Revelation and according to Matthew 24, Jesus himself, that's when the rapture of the church happens at this point. Now, we know that these happen near the end. And uh, right before the return of Jesus, right before the the uh, establishment here of the 1,000 year reign, uh, the rule of Christ upon this world, um, that's going to happen here in the 1,000th, uh, or right happen here at the end. That kicks in that 1,000 year rule or reign of Christ, and so that's where we're at in this point. Now, we started looking at trumpets, trumpets, and we looked at this in chapter eight. We look at trumpets one through uh, one through four, and one through four were these. Um, we started with the first trumpet that was that was um, that was uh, pronounced, and the first trumpet that was sounded. It says that there was hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown upon the earth. Now, I had looked at that last week, and the ultimate picture of what he is talking about, again, John is writing this from his perspective. Um, what he's really describing is a meteor shower, and we looked at that last week. A meteor shower would be trumpet number one, so this is trumpet number one, and he says that it's, it's with fire, so there would be fire streaming from this, and what could easily look like blood as a result of it, and that is what he is talking about. Now, this this um, hail and fire mixed with blood, they were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth burned up and uh, a third of the trees and a third of the green grasses burned up. Now, 
Hailstones is not going to do that. Hailstones is not going to not going to create that. But a meteor shower, which could easily look like hail that is coming through the atmosphere, that is going to land upon the Earth and easily light the Earth, you know, ablaze um, and create fires. Especially if you look at what could happen, and that is famines. Um, that happened in the seals that we looked at, a lot of the famines are going to happen because the earth is just not producing. Um, you know, there are massive droughts that are happening, happening everywhere. So the, the earth is really a tinderbox when it comes to easily being lit on fire by these different, uh, this different meteorite shower that could potentially come through. Again, we're reading this, trying to understand it from John's perspective and trying to make sense of what makes the most sense. And that really makes the most sense. And then you have number two. And what happened number two? Well, he says this, the second angel trumpeted and there was like a huge mountain ablaze with fire thrown into the sea. And now you have trailing behind. And if you look at astronomical uh, situations, you're going to see that a lot of these, a lot of these, um, asteroid fields are going to be made up of multiple things. You're going to have meteorites, you're going to have a larger meteorite, and then you could even have asteroids following that. And that's where we have number two. We have a larger, um, a lar he says it's a mountain ablaze. So we know that this is a very large meteorite, and this one is ablaze with fire. And this one is thrown. Now this is going to, this one hits the land, and this one is going to hit into the sea. Now think about what it would do if it hit the sea um, with that kind of power. You're going to have tsunamis that are going to take place across the world. And that would be throwing into the sea. Now that's, that's trumpet number two. Number three is going to go even a step beyond that. Number three, he says, there was a great star that fell from the heavens burning like a torch. And it fell on the third of the rivers and on the springs of water. Now the name of the star is Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the waters that were made bitter. So what we have here is a larger asteroid. Now the asteroid, the I, I believe the uh, the correct, and I'm not sure if I'm spelling it correct because I, I don't have my notes in front of me, but in the Greek the word for star is the word astir. And it means, literally, the definition is asteroid. And so what we're looking at is a large asteroid. And this one, again, is ablaze with fire. And so it's falling from the sky. So you have something like a mountain. And now you have something even larger trailing behind that. And this, again, is coming toward, uh, toward the world. And this one is going to have incredible destructive power, so much so that it says that a, uh, a third of the waters became bitter because of this, because of this event that is going to happen. Now you think of these events and the pummeling that's going to happen as a result of just the first three upon the world. Uh, think of the world in chaos as a result of these first three trumpet events. And again, these are not the wrath of God. These are the warning signs that the wrath of God is about to come. And so we, if we're still alive, will be living through these events. People will die through these events, obviously. It's, it's going to happen upon everybody. Um, but these are the events that it leads up in, in the first three trumpets. Then there was a fourth trumpet. And the fourth trumpet says that a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them were darkened. As a third of the day would not shine as well as a third of the night. And so what you're looking at here is maybe this potential asteroid field that is coming into, um, you know, into uh, uh, existence or, or, it's, or it's happening around us uh, could easily strike the could easily strike the moon. It could easily maybe strike the sun. I don't know if, it, if that was a possibility, uh, what that would exactly be. Um, but it's going to strike in such a way that it's going to darken the skies at least. And maybe if the moon is hit, that um, it's going to create, um, you know, maybe uh, really orbital problems with the Earth, gravitational problems with the Earth. It's going to cause the Earth not to rotate. And so maybe it's not rotating as fast as it was. Um, that could be a potential reason why the, you know, a third of the day it's it's not it's not happening the way that it's supposed to. Um, all of these are just different things that are going to be happening. So number four was that it's going to either strike the, the sun or it's going to strike the moon or it's going to create uh, orbital 
uh, kinds of problems that are going to happen upon the world so that the world is not rotating the way that it's supposed to. And it's going to create a, a darkness uh, that's going to happen. So now if there's an orbital problem, that would make sense as to why darkness would be uh, occurring because the Earth is not rotating now in a 24-hour period. It's rotating either slowly, uh, more slowly than it was before, or the tilt has been changed in some way so that the sun is not shining the way that it used to upon the world. So again, these are just speculations, but we just know that it's going to have some kind of tremendous impact. Now, all of these events, these trumpets are going to happen in quick, you know, right in this area. The, the trumpets, these are going to happen in very quick um, succession. Uh, you know, it could be hours um, that all of these things take place, or it could be, you know, within days or weeks. It's just, it's going to, it seems like it's all going to happen pretty quick succession. I wouldn't expect it would be weeks. I would expect it to be within minutes, hours, days of all of these events going to be taking place, you know, very, very close together. So let's get into, ch into trumpet number five, and we're going to see some things described in chapter nine that again, John is trying to describe, but he's having a hard time describing it, and we may be able to understand it a little bit better than John did when he actually wrote this. So let's look at this together. So John's, John writes this in chapter 9, then the fifth angel trumpeted. And so we've seen uh, we've seen these angels, the trumpets that have been sounded uh, by these angels. Um, we saw number one, it looks like little hailstones. Uh, that could be the meteorite shower that's all coming out uh, of the earth. Then we see number two uh, is going to be a a larger uh, asteroid, or I'm sorry, a larger meteor uh, that's going to happen as a result of coming upon the world. Then you're going to see a larger asteroid that is going to be hitting, um, and that's going to be coming down all of these trailing with fire. Um, and so John describes all of that. And then you see number four, Number four was it was going to be the same kind of events, but the number four is going to hit the sun, uh, the moon, and it could cause the orbital problems uh, upon the world. Uh, maybe knock off the tilt, um, the axis of the the world as well. And so you see this as being number number four, number three, number two, and number one. So again, all pretty quick um, succession. Now we have the number five. The fifth angel trumpeted, trumpeted, and I saw a star. Uh, so again, the, that word star, it had fallen from heaven to earth. So it came out of the out of the, the world. The key to the bottomless pit was given to him. And so the question becomes, well, who's the him? Is the him the angel that is being described, or is the him the star that is being described? Now, this star that is falling is also very reminiscent of the star of, of when Satan fell. When when Lucifer fell from heaven, it was this great, great morning star that, that fell, or this great star that fell upon the world, and that could be the same thing. So either we're, we're talking about another asteroid that is fallen, or we're talking about Satan's fall from heaven, where with his final fall from heaven, he is going to transfer uh, all uh, of his power uh, to the Antichrist. And so most likely it's one of those two events that you're seeing this great star fall. And really my, my mind goes to it's the final fall of Lucifer. It's the final fall of Satan because of what happens after that. That's why I'm saying this. Now the key to the bottomless pit was given to him. Well, what's the key to the bottomless pit that he's talking about? Well, it's the uh, the final Antichrist beastly empire. So number five, trumpet number five, is really the beastly empire of the Antichrist that is going to come into incredible conflict that it's going to happen. It says that he opened the pit and the smoke rose from the pit like the smoke of a gigantic furnace. So out of this pit, there is a great smoke that is arising and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the pit. So multiple scenarios that can happen. One, scenario number one is a situation where this is actually in an, another um, cosmic event where it's another you know, uh, asteroid that is falling from the sky and it hits. And as a result, um, it's going to do great devastation and smoke is going to rise and fill the air as a result of this asteroid 
uh, hitting the ground. Number two, you know, the possibility that we have here is this is a reference to Satan himself, to Lucifer, to Satan, and him falling out of heaven. This is the final casting down uh, that is going to happen to Satan, and he is going to open this pit. Now, the smoke then would be maybe not literal. Um, it could be a metaphor of the smoke that is arising being the smoke that accompanies battle and war. And so we, we have here, we have war and battle that is going on. And that's a very real possibility as well. And number three, you could even make some assumptions here and read into some assumptions that we are talking about some nuclear events that are happening as well. And these nuclear events could create this incredible, this incredible smoke that is beginning to rise. And so think about when you see a nuclear um, a nuclear device that has been set off, you see this great, this great mushroom cloud, you know, that great mushroom cloud in the sky. And this is maybe the kind of smoke that we are talking about here as well. So this could be reference to the, the air. The, so we have the sun and the air being darkened by the smoke from the pit. So when I read that, and you probably do as well, when you read that, you start to think, man, that could that could easily be some kind of a nuclear device that has just been set off. This great pit was just opened. In other words, this this massive nuclear explosion just happened and smoke rose from the pit like the smoke of a gigantic furnace. Now remember, John is describing something that he has never seen, has no comprehension of, never been a part of. He is from a, uh, you know, a first century person, believer. He is trying to describe something that we are seeing, you know, in the 21st, 20, you know, 21st century. He's trying to describe something that he has no concept of. And so when you read this, read it with that, that thought. Okay. What could John possibly be describing? Well, he's describing this star that is falling. Now that could, you know, that could even raise another thought of the star falling could be a nuclear, a nuclear launch as well. And a nuclear launch would be a star that is being launched from one place and being directed at another place. And that could be the star that is falling from heaven. This star, when it hits, when it makes when it makes impact, it opens up this incredible pit, and this incredible gigantic furnace smoke is unleashed. And um, the sun was darkened, the air was darkened by the smoke that came out of this pit. So what we're looking at is something dealing with, um, you know, with with the this kind of an event. So. I'm, I'm just going to erase that for a second, and I'm going to just say this could be one of multiple possibilities. And so I'll just write possibilities up here. And what are the possibilities? We have, we have a nuclear possibility. We have a metaphorical Satan falling from sky possibility. And we have another possibility of asteroids. So as you read that, think, okay, well, what, what could John possibly be describing? And it sounds... Like it could easily be any of those three events. And so there's, in, but again, incredible destruction that is happening in these trumpets. And these have not gotten to the wrath of God yet. This is not God's wrath. This is God pronouncing the warnings that you had better get ready for all that are left because it is coming. These things are going to be coming. And uh, whether it's a nuclear event that, that created the pit and the smoke from the pit like a gigantic furnace and the sun and the air darkened or whether it was another asteroid or whether it's a picture of uh, Satan being unleashed, all of his power being transferred to the Antichrist and a war battle that's going, it's going to be some, one of those. And, uh, you know, just, just speculate as to what that could possibly be. Number five, that leads uh, to number six. Let's look at, at as we keep going here. Then from the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given to them like the scorpions have power over the earth. So what does it say? It says locusts came upon the earth. What is that all about? Locusts came on the earth, power was given to them like the scorpions have power over the earth. What is this all about? Again, 
speculate with me. Again, this is from John's perspective. He's got a bird's eye view looking down upon the events that are happening and what locus easily could be would be the movement of military um, military units. The the so picture it this way. We have seal. Or we have Trump. Uh, Trump number five. If that was a nuclear attack, what would that create? Well, that nuclear attack is going to create a, a pit. Uh, the pit that is created in the ground. Out of the pit comes what? It comes this incredible this incredible mushroom cloud that comes out of this. This is a a cloud that is going to block the air in the sky. This is, if it's a nuclear attack, this is a military conflict, a military conquest. Now we know that it says that locusts come upon the earth. So from John's perspective, from heaven looking down, isn't it possible that what locusts would, what would look like locusts to him would be really, in fact, military equipment that is moving, uh, military personnel that are moving upon the world, that are moving upon the earth at that time. So John, from a eternal perspective, from a heavenly perspective, looking down to him, it could easily look like locusts that are moving upon the earth. I don't think personally that it's literal locusts, but I think it is more military units that are moving upon the earth. Now, what, there's reasons why I say that, but look at this. It says they were told to do no harm to the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only the people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They don't have the seal of God on their foreheads. This is an important point, the seal of God. Now, many of your Bibles will capitalize this G. It'll capitalize the G of God. And when they capitalize it, you automatically go to the thought of, well, this is the seal of of our God, the Almighty God, Yahweh, the Creator God, Elohim, that they don't have the seal of Elohim. The problem is that this, in my opinion, should not be a capitalized G, but it should instead be a lowercase g, because the word God here in this reference is the Greek word theos. Now, the word theos is not used to describe the Almighty God. It's not describing Elohim, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It's not describing Yahweh, uh, the great I Am. It's not describing our God as we know him. It's not using Adonai. The word Theos just simply means, uh, it means deity. That's all it means. It means deity. It is just, it, it could be a lesser God, a, a lesser, something that is worshipped in deity form attack instead the people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Now, who would possibly not have the seal of God? If Theos is just a deity, this could easily be attack the people who do not have the seal of Allah on their foreheads. The seal of Allah. You know that it's going to say that the mark of the beastly empire will be written either on the on the arm or the forehead of the followers of the beast. It is very common practice and common knowledge that under following Muslim rule, Islam rule, that in many places they would be marked so that they could buy or sell. You, in fact, will see this on people uh, who are very, very orthodox when it comes to following their Muslim faith, that they will have tattoos on their head or or on their arm, a uh, hand maybe, in order to show that they have allegiance to Allah. Now look at it in this, read it in this way then. Now this military conflict, this military unit who has power, who is moving across the world like locusts, they, they don't touch the grass of the earth or green plant, only those who do not have the seal of God. They're not worried about the grass. They're not worried about plants. They're not worried about trees. They want to take out the people who do not have the seal of God. Now, who would be the people who do not have the seal of God? Well, this is going to be, number one, this is going to be people of Israel. People of Israel are the ones um, who do not have the seal of God. Um, so they are to harm anybody who does not have the seal of Allah. That will be all of Israel. They're going to wipe them out. Number two would be the Christians who are the true 
Israel, the true believers, who have really surrendered to Messiah. They do not have the seal of the beast upon them. They will not take the seal of the beast. They will not take the mark of the beast. So these are the ones that are going to be attacked. These two groups of people are the ones. Now, there will also be a third group, and that will just be the others. I'll just you know, we'll, we'll just categorize them as others because there's going to be people around the world who are not Muslim, who have never accepted the rule of Muslim rule, and they will not have the seal of God. And so they will be easily attacked as well. Uh, America, for example, right now, it's referred to by the Middle Eastern uh, nations, Iran in particular, as the great Satan. We are seen as the great Satan, which Absolutely blows my mind then why the Biden administration would um, would remove any uh, uh, any uh, sanctions against uh, against Iran. I don't know why they would remove that. They're just rewarding their horrific uh, their ter terrorist behaviors. But regardless, you're going to have other people around the world that have not taken the seal of Allah on them. Uh, they're just going to naturally do so. So anybody who isn't marked is free game, which could be the, all of Israel, all of the Christians, or any other people who have just not accepted it, not not bowed down to it, just don't, aren't Muslims and don't want to have this. They will be easy prey. Now, uh, anyone who has the seal of God, they were not permitted to kill them, but to torment them for five months. And their torment was like that of the scorpion when it stings a person. So it will be a tormenting thing. So again, that's that's a, a possibility that that is what is being referenced there. Um, and so why they're allowed to torment? Well, if you look at within the Muslim nation, there are they are warring with each other all the time. There are factions constantly going against each other. You're going to have the Sunnis and you're going to have the Shia uh, that will be fighting back and forth. You do know that there will be parts of the um, parts of the world who um, who haven't bowed down to this, but there's still going to be conflict and they're going to they're going to fall under some kind of persecution as well. Uh, we've looked at those countries, what those countries possibly could be that aren't going to join with the beastly empire and they will be uh, part of this. So we know that that's a pot, that this is one way to read this is that the people who have, who do not have the seal of God uh, on their foreheads, they're permitted to, uh, to not kill them, uh, but to torment them. So that's one, again, one possibility. Now, we can look at other possibilities of what is going on here, and that, you know, that may be one possibility, but that may not be the ultimate answer. We, we again, speculation, we don't really know uh, this, uh, you know, this with certainty. So what, what else is there some possibilities of? Another possibility is this military campaign. These are against, you know, the real uh, people of God, the seal of God. Did you know? that according to what the Bible says, that you will be sealed, you have the seal of God on you. If you're a follower of Christ, you have the seal of God. Uh, it was not put there by you, it was put there by God himself, and you have that seal of God. And so that's another possibility, that there's this, this great uh, army that is going to come against Israel, against Christians, against other people who have the seal of God. Now, Israel, not all of Israel has the seal of God, but there are a lot of Christians who do have the seal of God, and this military battle will come against us, but we are not able to be killed, only tormented. That's another possibility. All we know is verse six, in those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will, they will long to die, but death will flee from them. This is again, all part of the fifth, uh, fifth trumpet that has been blown. Now, Let's go to the locusts again. And this is why I say the locusts are most likely a military campaign, because here's what John writes. He says, now the appearance of the locusts, it was like horses. So again, use this word like. Like is uh, the, the word that we have is um, a simile or it's similar to. Uh, it's similar to. The locusts, they, they were like horses prepared for battle. Now on these locusts, on their heads, were something like crowns of gold, and their faces were like human faces. So think of, as John is seeing this, think of a soldier with a helmet on, and John saying, 
uh, it looks like they have crowns of gold, but I see a human face. Because he's never seen a military helmet like what he's seeing as he sees them. Does that make sense? He, he So he's looking at them and says, well, they have human faces, but they have crowns on, but the crowns are not really crowns. It's helmets because they're part of a military group. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like those of lions. They had chests like iron breastplates. Now, again, that's either the, the soldiers that are equipped for battle, or now we're looking at things like tanks. The noise of their wings was like the noise of many horse-drawn chariots rushing into battle. So if you look at this, what is what does the noise like wi wings start to remind you of? Well, helicopters. Uh, you can look at um, the noise like the wings could be uh, airplanes. You could see airplanes. Uh, so you have you have helicopters, you have airplanes. The chest like iron breastplates could easily be tanks that he is seeing. You're looking at military people that have helmets and you see their face and they have this, these incredible warfare machines that John can't describe because there's no words to describe it because he's a first century person trying to describe what we are seeing in the end. So what he sees is tanks and he sees airplanes and he sees helicopters like horse-drawn chariots rushing into battle. They have tails like like scorpions with stingers. Think of Think of that being things like missiles that they're able to fire. They have, so, so he's saying they have, they, out of the, out of the front of them or out of the tail, the, the things that are being launched, they're like stingers, they're missiles in their tails. They have power to harm people. So again, this is a military conflict that's going to happen for five months. Now, why is this the beastly empire? Because it says it right here. They have as a king over them, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he has the name Apollyon. Now, again, this is the this is the Antichrist who Satan has given all of his power, transferred all power to the Antichrist, who now leads the army, the military. The military, the army of the beastly empire, and we see this this military, this army, who is now has who, who has soldiers, who has um, who has rocket launchers. So we have, you know, rocket launchers. We have helicopters here. We have, you know, Apache helicopters that are being flown into this. We have uh, airplanes that are being flown into this. We have modern military equipment that is all part of this, and it's all being run by the Antichrist. So this is why this whole number five of the trumpets is really the beastly empire that is coming and doing battle. They are coming like locusts. They are coming against the people who do not have the seal of God on their heads. They are going to torment them for five months, and then they are going to um, just keep pursuing and keep uh, creating harm to these people. So again, uh, why? that's why I said it seems like the seal of God, what he is attacking here is Israel, because these are the groups that do not have the seal of God on their heads. Israel, Christians, and then you have others, and these are just the groups. Now, it doesn't mean that they're all following Christ. That is only the Christians here that are following Christ, but the others have just not taken the mark. They they have not taken the mark of the beast upon them, and as a result, they are the ones that are being attacked. So that is that is number um, th that is really uh, number number five. So let's look. Let's keep looking at this. So John writes and says, the first woe is past. So what is the first woe? Well, that would be trumpets one through five that we just read. That's the first woe. Behold, two woes, that's trumpets number six uh, and seven, are still coming after these things. The sixth angel trumpeted, and I heard a single voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God. It said to the sixth angel, the one holding the trumpet now release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And so we are getting closer and closer to the end at this point. 
we have had this pummeling of the earth that has happened. We have had the beastly empire that is creating all kinds of turmoil and chaos. Now release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Let's, let's, keep, uh, let, let's keep reading through this. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour. So, so they have been prepared. These four angels have been waiting for this moment. They have been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year. So there is a specific hour, a specific day, a specific month, and a specific year that all of this is going to be unleashed. So it will be all unleashed according to God's timetable. He already has the hour, the day, the month, and the year determined ahead of time. And then all of this will be released. They will be released to kill a third of mankind. Now, the number of the mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. So what I want you to see in number six is that this is different for number five. So... Look at this. Now, again, speculation, because we don't know for sure, but it just, it makes sense. Number five is the beastly empire. And the beastly empire, led by the Antichrist and its incredible war machine, has now come upon Israel, has now come upon the Christians, and has now come upon others who do not have the same seal. Number six, we see a different military, it appears, who are going to be released to kill a third of mankind. This military power is going to be a military power that's going to have 200 million soldiers that are a part of this empire. Now, what military empire or might could potentially have this? And what you're looking at here is the potential of China. China that will be coming against this beastly empire. There is 200 million. Now, China will be unleashed and it will probably go into different directions across the world because we know that one third of the Earth's mankind, one third of the population of the Earth, one third of mankind will die as a result uh, of this empire. So it will be killed. So you're going to have multiple militaries are going to be at play here. Now it says, John says, I heard their number. I heard it. It, it was 200 million. Now here's what I saw. The horses and those riding on them had breastplates. They were fiery red, uh, hastened blue and sulfur yellow. So what are the colors? It is blue, it is red, it is yellow. Those are the colors that are going to be of this, of this military that is going to be unleashed upon the world. We know at least for certain that red and yellow are part of that Chinese, uh, Chinese military. Now there's another possibility here, and that is you have Russia joining into the mix and they are also adding in their numbers to this military might, this military campaign. And then possibly you have blue as a result of, of that. You know, look at Russia's flag, red, white, and blue. And you're going to have blue being a part of that as well. So again, speculation. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure it out. But we know that these trumpets are going to be uh, unleashing these things. Now, the heads of the horses were the heads of lions and out of their mouths came fire and smoke and brimstone. So again, from John's perspective, what could that be? Well, that could be some, again, some kind of a military, uh, military machine of some kind. It could be a tank of some kind. It could be, it's something that out of their mouth, so out of the front of the tank comes explosions of fire and smoke and brimstone. So again, when you read through John, uh, read through John's writing in Revelation, you don't have to take it literal that that it's going to be a locus, uh, but start try to picture what John would have been seeing and read it that way. Again, this is all speculation. This is what it seems to be communicating, and so we'll see. It's those are things that we're going to have to see uh, as a result of this. Let's let's wrap this up here today uh, with the final stuff. So by these three plagues, so three plagues, what are the three plagues? It says a third of the mankind was killed. 
by the plagues of fire and smoke and the brimstone that came out of their mouths. Trumpet number six, out of the mouths of what? Of the military machinery that is launching. So you have the military machinery of rocket launchers, of missile launchers. You have the nuclear uh, launches that could happen. You have helicopters. You have, um, you know, whatever ammunition is being used. You can have airplanes that are firing rockets. Out of this comes fire. It comes smoke, and then it comes brimstone. So this, to me, nuclear and military are the key things that it appears that is happening in the trumpet scenario. So in the trumpets, you have the first three, first four that we looked at. These were all astronomical. So these were astro uh, things that were happening, coming out of the heavens to the earth. It was happening to the earth. You have number five which appears to be uh, appears to be the beastly empire. Uh, you know, I should say it would really be number three and four, one through four. Five could, we speculated it could be nuclear. Uh, no, number four could be nuclear. Number five, the beastly empire. Number six, another military, most likely a Chinese and Russian combined military. And they are also doing battle upon the world. And they are, they are creating a third of plagues, which were fire, smoke, and brimstone. And again, John is seeing all of this coming out of their mouths. For the power of, their horses, of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents. So what are they riding on? They're riding on helicopters, riding on tanks. They're riding on um, uh, up-armored vehicles. So out of their mouths and out of their tails, they're, it's like serpents. Because why? Because it's missiles that are being fired out of it. It's rockets that are being fired out of it. It's, uh, you know, uh, rounds of ammunition that are being fired out of this. Having heads by which they inflict injuries. So again, what John is spec was saying here is things that would have been completely foreign to him. But we can start to understand it when you look at it through the context of our current society today. Now, the rest of the mankind, those not killed by these plagues, did not repent and turn away from the works of their hands. And this is a key phrase. They did not repent and turn away. What is the purpose of the trumpets? It is the heralding that God's wrath is about to come the heralding it so the trumpets are blowing the sound the warning the final warning like the walls of jericho they marched around for seven days and they blew a trumpet every day on the final day they marched around seven times they blew the trumpet and the walls fell down it was a warning that wrath is coming and in the warning, people have to repent because God is near. He is about to come, but they did not repent, though the book gives the warning of what's going to happen. They did not repent and turn away from the works of their hands. They would not stop worshiping demons and the idols of gold and silver and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. And so here's what you have. They're worshiping demons. This is false religion. This is all of the false religions of the world. They will not turn. And what is idols of gold and silver? This is the greed and the materialistic society for those who do not follow one of the false religions of the world. These are the greedy materialistic people. So people would not repent and turn away, even though they're seeing all of these events take place right before their eyes. Even though we have taught and, and read and looked at and seen, they would not repent and stop worshiping the false gods and the idols of gold and silver and stone and wood, which those things cannot see or hear or walk. <coughs> and they did not, again, they did not repent and turn away from their murders or their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their stealing. They would not repent. And that's the whole key of this, that God is giving the warning to us so that as Christians, we can be ready for what is going to come so that we can be warning other people to help them get ready and hopefully leading people to repentance, to turn away from the way that they were going 
and to turn to God and follow him. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. <coughs> they would not turn and follow. They would not turn and repent. They would not turn away from their false gods, their religion, their greed, their materialism, from their murders or sorceries or sexual immorality or stealing. And in the end, they would ultimately be destroyed. God is giving warning after warning. He is giving He is giving things that we can see. He's telling people, be ready, be aware, <coughs> be warned that this is coming. And they still would not repent. Well, we're going to close it out right there. That is chapter 9. We are going to get into chapter 10, and we are going to see a little bit of a, a little bit of a, um, a, a, kind of a, a pause here where we're going to look at some other events in 10 and 11 before we get to the seventh trumpet that will happen at the end of chapter 11. So we'll keep plugging away. Thank you for joining me today and giving of your time to be a part of this. I hope it was helpful. I hope you learned something. And again, I'm not coming to you as one who has all of the answers, but you can read through it and start to put the pieces together yourself and to understand and speculate about what kind of events are actually happening and what kind of events is God saying will happen. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you back here next time. Have a wonderful week. Have a blessed week. And I will see you back here next Sunday for another End Times Prophecy in the Book of Revelation study. See you then.